conversation. We've been talking with the panelists today uh, for a few weeks now about this topic. And we wanna make sure that we open it up to some of the questions that you might have as well. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will, you will see the Q&A section. If you have questions for them, please drop them into that section, include your names, titles, and the organization that, organizations that you represent, and we'll get to them toward the end of this uh, today's conversation. So thank you all for joining me here today. And I wanna stop this share. All right, so um, we wanted to start out with you, Randy, and about uh, hear a little bit more about the, the origins of the Health Estimator tool, why you developed it, how it was used in Oregon. Yeah, thanks, Christian, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Christian noted, this is, uh, this is what Oregon looks like right now in the daylight. Uh, the wind shifted out of the east and it's filled the valley up with uh, smoke and ash from all the wildfires that are burning in California, Oregon, and Washington. So hot and dry for sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take a couple minutes here uh, and let you know how we came about developing this tool. Um, basically, the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation planning process. Each state has to go through that to access land and water conservation funds to invest in recreation infrastructure programming and other types of things. Um, back in 2017, uh, Oregon State Parks that manages that program contacted me. I've been involved in previous SCORPS uh, since I arrived here almost two decades ago. And they challenged me and said, you know, we, we have a lot of information about economic impacts. We have a lot of information about participation, uh, what people want. What we don't really know is a better understanding of how outdoor recreation and the environment improves the quality of life of people that live in the state, in Oregon. And so they challenged me, come up with some estimates. We wanna quantify, because you know we all know how important outdoor recreation is, but quite often it's treated as leisure activities. It's treated as, oh, it would be nice once you can take care of everything else you have to take care of in your lives. Uh, so if we could quantify this, we could put it on scale where it's competing with other public services and it's really getting the recognition that it deserves uh, and its role that it plays in community health and individual health. Uh, so I had, uh, Take, taken on that challenge. And I said, well, we could come up with two estimates. And one is uh, total net economic value. We're not gonna talk about that today. Uh, but for Oregon, we estimated the value to Oregonians for having access to outdoor recreation was about $54 billion a year. And compare that to tourism revenue, which is about 17 billion a year. So that, that does show us uh, that people value above and beyond what they invest. The other part of this though is the health. This is where we can really connect and grow our networks and partnerships. Uh, so I took the challenge and uh, Tara Dunn, uh, who's now Tara Pesterfield, uh, she was a honors college student in our college of forestry. Uh, I hired her for a year and we went out and looked at the literature and we found uh, an interesting uh, application of a model in Tennessee, the great state of Tennessee, and Leslie was involved in that. Uh, and we also found a small application here in Oregon uh, of a, an underlying model. And what this model is, it's the integrated transportation health impacts model. It was developed by Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Mayslich, basically to estimate the health benefits associated with active transportation, uh, basically biking and walking. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the model that they developed. It, it has you know, three basic components to it. Uh, one of those components is understanding how does physical activity improve people's health? And, and basically through physical activity, cardiovascular, there's a physiological response to that that actually reduces the risk of chronic illnesses. And they map this into eight chronic illnesses, including things like heart disease, uh, depression, diabetes, some cancers. Uh, and they connected these things in together by showing when people are physically active, they reduce their risk of these chronic illnesses. If you reduce your risk, 
then there's a measure called uh, a disability adjusted life year. This is the additional length in life expectancy plus the quality of that uh, remaining time. And they could show that, you know, if we could measure this uh, and then convert it into a monetary metric, i.e. the cost to illness savings through uh, reduced healthcare expenditures and improved worker productivity, that we could come up with these estimates. So this is what the ITHA model does, is that it starts with physical activity, connects that through to a relative risk reduction for chronic illnesses, and then converts that relative risk reduction into these cost to illness measures. Um, so we thought, well, can we adapt that to outdoor recreation? And the key point that we did, and it wasn't you know, really that difficult to do, um, is that the ITHA model that we're working with is an Excel spreadsheet uh, based model. So it's very accessible. And what we did was we took that portal for cycling and walking, and we expanded that to 31 outdoor recreation activities, anywhere from um, driving outdoor vehicles, motorcycling, walking, hiking, jogging, trail running, uh, canoeing, other paddling activities. Uh, we even got into soccer, softball, uh, and field-based activities. Um, and so what we could connect with that was under the energy expenditure or a MET. This is a metabolic equivalent task. Sitting idle is equivalent to one. Walking is roughly three METs. So there's a 300% increase in the expenditure of energy through physical activity from a resting state to walking uh, at a brisk pace. Jogging or cycling is about a 6.0 MET. So a 600% increase in expenditure. So basically, if you walk for 30 minutes or jog for 30 minutes, you would get twice the energy expenditure with jogging as you would for walking. So we took these uh, activity estimates, uh, METs, from the Ainsworth Compendium. Uh, this is a health science compendium that basically identified how much MET energy expenditure occurs for all kinds of different activities. Uh, and this could even be vacuuming uh, the carpets or gardening. So it's, it's all types of physical activity. Uh, so we mapped those onto 31 activities and created a portal into the ITHM model. Uh, and through this then, we could identify how much energy expenditure, i.e. risk reduction, uh, that leads to cost illness savings for these 31 activities. What we didn't have was participation rates. Uh, so we know how much energy, but how, what's the duration and frequency of physical activity of Oregonians? And this is where the SORP process came into play. We did a statewide survey uh, of over 3,000 households and identified for 56 different outdoor activities uh, the amount of participation in a given year each of these individuals did. And then we uh, weighted that and expanded out to the state population. So we had the total estimate. And we came up with uh, about 330 million user occasions in Oregon uh, for all Oregonians combined. Uh, this leads to, I think it was over 500 billion uh, calories expended. Um, and we came up with our yuck factor. It was equivalent to like 26 Olympic sized swimming pools filled with oxidized body fat. <laughs> so it was a lot of energy that was expended in that. Uh, so we brought the sport together with the ITHM model uh, and we were able to estimate this $1.42 billion. Um, this immediately uh, was getting picked up. Uh, we did a workshop at Shift. We've had some other conversations with with other individuals around uh, looking at how we can expand this model because right away, the way we use this in Oregon is, again, the Land Water Conservation Fund grant money that we can give out. We put priority points because we also did a parkland mapping project. We identified at-risk communities that didn't have access to outdoor recreation and we could target these specific areas and show to the legislators, show to the health industry 
that there are significant benefits to be gained if we start looking at the at-risk populations and making investments in not only having the infrastructure available so that people can get there or can access it, but the access issue, like where do the bus lines run? How do we get people uh, to these locations? How do we create safe spaces and how do we get them out and, and more active? Uh, and then recently, um, you know, we were in conversation with Leslie and the uh, state of Tennessee about how this model can be adapted elsewhere uh, to add that information. So that's kind of a, a rough breakdown. Uh, I do want to, one last thing I do want to say is that some of you may have uh, joined a webinar when they're talking about a trails calculator. Uh, and so you might want to know what's the relationship between this health impact estimator tool and the trails calculator. Uh, the trails calculator focuses mostly on trails, but it's still the same idea, right? It's the METS times the duration and physical activity, but the um, trails calculator is really specific to identifying the marginal changes in the health uh, and a benefit cost framework that would help you identify is the investment of $1.2 million into a trail network worth the cost from a public health standpoint. And so that's what that's addressing, where the health impact tool that we developed is really an accounting framework, basically based on what people are currently doing, what is the health savings that a state would see from that type of physical activity. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for all the work that you're doing, too. It's such a great Welcome. contribution to the field. And um, Leslie, uh, I'd like to bring you into this conversation um, and, and starting out with how, when you were working with the De Tennessee Department of Transportation, you were um, using the integrated transport and health impact modeling tool that really is the foundation of Randy's tool. Could you share with us a little bit about that? Sure. The Integrated Transportation Health Impact Tool was created in the UK about eight or so years ago. And I read about it in a journal. There was a pilot application that was done in the Bay Area of San Francisco. And I thought, this sounds fantastic. This is exactly what we're looking for. How can we show to our elected officials and the public that there are greater implications of the decisions that they are making. And while we are planning infrastructure for roadways, how can we illustrate that there are many health benefits to having opportunities to walk and bike? And so we ran the model for a 10 county region in Nashville, Tennessee. And we found that we were programming about as much money in transportation as we were able to avert in healthcare costs. And these are hospitalizations and healthcare visits that were not going to happen because of the health benefits of getting physical activity. The model is fantastic because it shows you exact reductions that you can expect at a population level in areas like heart disease and diabetes and even uh, looking at mental health benefits. And then when those are monetized, it gives you an opportunity to go to decision makers and to look holistically at the impacts of these decisions and really applaud them for investing in opportunities, in this case, for walk, bike, or transit infrastructure so that they could see the positive benefits that they were having on the health of the population as well as those mobility benefits. Yeah, thank you. And so um, how has this led you to the health estimator tool? And how are you hoping to use it? And why, do, why do we need and why do you need the, da the data that you're expecting that it'll generate? Well, first I'd really like to tip a hat to our sister agency, the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. They are the agency that oversees the state parks and we are so proud of our state parks in Tennessee. Like many parks across the nation, they've been particularly popular these last several months. And I just can't speak highly enough for the creativity and the ingenuity that our, our State Parks Department has. And they came to us and approached us with running this model, which we thought would be fantastic since we'd had some past experience with it at another agency. And they are going to be collecting SCORP data this year. So we will have that user data, which as Randy mentioned, is really critical to run the model. And then he's done all the heavy lifting for us. So we have the calculations where we know how many METs 
can be expended through different activities. So all we'll have to do is plug in our user data from across the state. One of the reasons that we are really excited about this is because we know there are many benefits, those social, emotional, and physical health benefits of getting outside. In fact, a colleague of mine last, name, last week, Rajin from Memphis, she uh, said that time outside is, is like health squared. So you're getting a double bang for your buck. You're not only getting physical activity, but you're getting these mental and emotional health benefits that we are really learning how to quantify. So this model is exceptionally important for us to talk about the importance of the outdoors. It's, it's not just a lovely thing to do, but a really integral part of health for all Tennesseans. We're looking at this model as a suite of tools. We've also adapted something called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It's a, a survey that all state health departments do. The data goes to the CDC, but we've asked added questions about access to and utilization of trails and parks, because we would like to better understand who has access to these types of amenities and who are, who's using them. And those who have access to those amenities are more likely to be meeting their physical activity targets. So we look at this as if you build it, they will come. We also have an incredible program called Healthy Parks, Healthy Person. It's a prescription program. It's fantastic. Uh, our providers at the Tennessee Department of Health or any provider can actually write a prescription to go to any park and engage in physical activity like paddling or walking or bicycling. Users can also download an app. You can download that app today. And when you download the Healthy Park, Healthy Person app, it allows you to log physical activity and then you can be eligible for prizes like a guided hike with a ranger at a state park or even a, a free night stay at a state park inn. So our state parks department really understands and values the health benefits of utilizing both state and local parks across Tennessee. Well, thank you. Um, and congratulations on all the work that you're doing about this. We're, we're so excited about it from where we're sitting here in Wyoming and looking out over the country's efforts to advance the health and nature movement. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And Senator Gilmore, um, we wanted to get to you and uh, to learn a little bit more about why you started the Kids and Kites campaign and um, why it was important both to you and to the people that you served. Thank you. Thank you. And it's an honor to be here with this on this panel. So um, I represent part of Nashville, Tennessee. It's a very diverse area, including the business community. However, a large portion of it is underserved in uh, the urban area. And um, I'm aware that Tennessee ranks probably in the top 10 in the country with childhood obesity. And I know that that has long-term consequences in terms of hypertension, um, diabetes, strokes, cancer, and even uh, dying at a very early age. And the residents uh, in my community sometimes don't allow their children to go outside because of fear of crime or violence or even lack of sidewalks in their communities where they could have uh, go out and walk. So, we came up with um, an idea of kids and kites. One is because modern day children probably have never flown a kite a day in their life. And uh, those of you who are my age and older may remember flying kites and how much fun it is. So we bring them to, um, uh, uh, to the park, Bicentennial Park, which is a safe space for them. We furnish the kites for them, recognizing that if we can create ha healthy lifestyles uh, from this day, that they may take that back home and continue it throughout the year. In Tennessee, about 38% of the children are obese. And so we wanna do everything that we can to get them uh, to move in. We do all kinds of fun activities that day, jumping rope, hula hooping. We have a fun run. Uh, we have bicycling, we dance, we have music. Um, we have healthy food, no soap, anything like that. Uh, and so hopefully by creating these um, 
giving them these healthy lifestyles and these It sounds as if we've got a little bit of a freeze going on. Randy, can you hear? Okay, and Leslie? Randy, we're going to circle back to you in just a sec. Um, and what I would like to, uh, what we want to talk to you about, Senator Gilmore, when you come back on is, is what you've been hearing about the health estimator tool and how, how it could influence um, your legislative efforts to promote access to the outdoors. Are you back? You froze a little bit there. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, we'll circle back with you in just a second. Um, and I wanted to get over to Randy again and just um, see, Randy, what's most exciting to you about the adaptation of the, of the tool by the state of Tennessee and how else you'd like to see it get scaled? Okay, sorry, my, my screen froze a little bit. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yeah, great, 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 great. So <laughs> I think that um, I'm in a very conservative um, general assembly and I think that uh, this tool will assist us in ensuring that it's not just flood. Uh, but it's a way of quantifying and saving money in health costs. Um, my screen keeps freezing on me. Yes. Can you hear me, Kristen? Okay. It's not just fluff, but it's a way of quantifying, saving money in health costs. Um, also, especially as we go through this pandemic period, when most general assemblies are reducing their costs, trying to save money, uh, particularly in Tennessee, where almost a half a million people do not have insurance or either are underinsured, we can think of low cost ways of having fun and still being active. Because walking and being out on the trails is a very inexpensive way to have fun and be active at the same time. And for our conservative colleagues, by putting a dollar value on it, I think that that's the best of our worlds. Some may from education because we recognize that when you're outside it improves your academic as some may uh, approach it like me recognizing it improves your health and long-term consequences if, when you become adult but the more conservative legislators will look at it bottom line how is this saving the state of Tennessee some money exactly and that's uh, one of our primary um, objectives with SHIFT is to develop the business case for time outside for exactly that reason. Right? So I fully concur with you on that. Um, Randy, getting back to you about uh, this, uh, this adaptation of the tool by Tennessee, um, what's, what's most exciting about that to you and how else would you like to see the tool scaled? Yeah, you know, that's a real good question. And um, I'm going to diverge just ever so slightly. I'll bring it all back together in the end here. Um, but yeah, I got involved in some of this research uh, back in 2000 when I moved from uh, working with the Rocky Mountain Research Station with the Forest Service and Colorado State University. I moved to West Virginia University as my first faculty appointment. And when I got there, like Senator Gilmore said, you know, the lack of sidewalks, the lack of people outside relative to Colorado really intrigued me. Uh, and so it got me wondering, uh, is there a relationship here? And so what I wound up doing at West Virginia is uh, I did a health linkages model that linked at the county level uh, physical activity rates, uh, obesity, and overweight rates uh, from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system data that Leslie mentioned um, and compared that to healthcare costs and the recreation infrastructure uh, in the state of West Virginia and found a, a strong spatially positive correlation amongst those. Uh, then moved out here to Oregon State University where again Oregon State Parks I barely unpacked and they contacted me and said, hey, we read your article out of West Virginia. Can you do that model here? Uh, and at the same time, the Pacific Northwest Research Station with the Forest Service said, hey, we'd like to get in on that too. 
uh, instead of running it for just the state of Oregon, could you build a model that would be in kind of their uh, arenas, include the state of Washington and Northern California? And, and so, you know, again, I said, sure, I can do that. And then I started looking for data. Uh, and what I found was that Oregon State Parks does an inventory along with their score surveying uh, every five years where they identify types of trails, number of trail miles, regardless of whether it's municipalities or county parks or state parks or even uh, federal lands, uh, along with number of soccer fields and, you know, all these different, all this type of information that they have. Uh, and that information did not exist for California, and that information did not exist for the state of Washington. Uh, so it really kind of opened my eyes that we really have a lack of consistent data across the nation so that we can look at different patterns. Uh, even the score surveys are done at a highly variable rate. So cross comparisons, and we can learn from each other, from our neighboring states, from uh, states in Tennessee with projects that they're doing or down in El Paso with, with the trail project. Uh, the, what we really need is a standardized consistent way to be able to collect data so that we can talk to each other using the same levels of information. We can learn from projects. Uh, we can share information and share efforts. And so that's kind of what my hope with the health uh, tool is is although it's built around Oregon's population demographics, um, there's really only that and then having the statewide participation data that's needed to be able to adapt the tool. And I would love to see the tool adapted for all 50 states uh, and outlying areas so that we can start having these conversations. Uh, that would drive the need for consistent surveying of our residents in each of the states. Um, and, and again, just elevating this discussion from, you know, just within a single state legislature, but across legislative bodies at the federal level, uh, so that we can shake loose some funding so that we can learn, we can invest, and we can become better in our communities. And so that's kind of the, the real hope here uh, with being able to adapt this. And I think Tennessee is gonna be the, the test case of how easily this tool can be modified uh, to fit a different state. Um, and now, you know, Tennessee will join Oregon with being able to talk uh, from this platform. Uh, and I think people are, are listening for sure. Thank you. And I think you're underscoring the importance of, of collaboration in, in uh, adapting this, this tool. And Leslie, I know that's been an important consideration for you in Tennessee. I wonder if you can speak to that importance and um, what people can learn from Tennessee's uh, example of collaboration in adopting the tool. Well, as you mentioned, collaboration is, is really the key to all of this. There is not one agency that has access to all the data or all the funding to be able to achieve all of the many successes that we all want to see. We are right now collecting our state's first inventory, like the ones Randy mentioned, where we will, for the first time, know where all the parks and greenways and playgrounds and splash pads are in our state. We have over a dozen agencies that are working together to not only collect that data, but to think about how we might pool our funding and how will that data be housed and how will it be maintained. So collaboration is absolutely the name of the game. We also have a, a neat collaboration with the American College of Sports Medicine. They have an exercise as medicine program that you may have heard of. And we have adapted that for our clinics along in a partnership with the University of Tennessee Chattanooga so that we can refresh our doctors and nurses skills about how to assess patient level physical activity and how to safely prescribe appropriate levels of physical activity. And then we can note that in the electronic medical record and we can use that healthy park, healthy person prescription program that I mentioned. So all of these are very important collaborations. And I'd be really remiss if we didn't mention a piece of legislation that Senator Gilmore sponsored our previous legislative session. And this was to create the Tennessee Outdoors Education and Recreation Task Force. And the task force members were required to be our Department of Environment and Conservation, so our state parks folks, 
the Department of Health, the Department of Education, the Department of Agriculture, and we were charged with doing a few things. One, to really comb the literature and come up with all of the reasons that we wanna have kids be outside. Be everything from benefits to their health, to academic benefits, and we had so many examples, we uh, weren't even able to put them all into the report because there's been so much great literature done. Then we were able to comb the state and look at what resources and programs do we have that are encouraging children to get outside. And then the last charge was to really look at the opportunities. What are we not investing in yet? Where could we be putting more emphasis and more resources to get children outside? And this report was delivered back to Senator Gilmore and her legislative counterparts in July just a, a few months ago, and we are, are really excited to see what will come of the recommendations. And we are really excited about all of these partnerships because it's, we're much better fiscal stewards of our state resources when we all realize that as departments and agencies, we really do have common missions and visions. And if we pool together our brain power and our funding, we can get a lot more done and have a greater collective impact. So we're, we are excited about everything that we have going on. Uh, that's excellent. And um, Senator Gilmore, thank you for all the work that you're doing on behalf of your state and your constituents. And, and you were referencing some of the vulnerable populations that, you're, that you are serving. Um, how, could, how could this tool help to reach those populations? Well, I think just the recognition with um, my colleagues that out being outdoors and being active uh, has an impact on your physical being, your your social being, your health beings, and um, academic success, particularly during the formative years. And as I had mentioned earlier, while we all may approach it from a different perspective on how we appreciate it, the bottom line is if we can get children outside and get them moving. It has long-term um, benefits. And also, it means a stronger population, which means that they'll be better employed and uh, working out in the community, uh, which will help have some also economic benefits to the state of Tennessee and um, other states across, uh, across the country. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Randy, so what, what, what would you like to see folks that are listening here today walk away from this, this discussion understanding? What's, what's most important to you? Well, I think what's most important to me uh, with the discussion is that, you know, we can quantify um, these different types of estimates. And just the power of numerology, the power of having a number that can be stacked up against all kinds of other uh, programs is important. Uh, and that's in a competitive model. But if we look at a collaborative model, and this is where, you know, I, I think Oregon is trying to catch up to Tennessee, is that uh, with our tool that we developed, it has ties in with the Oregon transportation. Uh, it, it also has now ties in with Oregon Health Authority. And given that, you know, we're uh, health insurance self-funded state that we actually can see that these you know these monies are somewhat fungible and can be moved in different directions uh, and we even have you know some of our um, public health provider uh, on the insurance side is already stepped up um, and is looking at doing things like uh, subsidizing cost of um, uh, health club membership, uh, subsidizing other types of costs, doing a health impact modeling, uh, behavioral modeling, so that people can, you know, demonstrate that they're, uh, or at least commit to being more active, uh, and knowing that, you know, you're walking the dog counts, then, then I think we get more people talking together, uh, and we start moving in a common direction and getting away from the competitive model. Uh, that typically surrounds budget allocations and, and those types of things. So, so it's kind of twofold, but I think quantification is, is key to elevate the discussion. Uh, and again, I just want people to know that we can quantify. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> we do want to get to some of the questions that we've got coming in here. Folks, if you do have questions, go ahead and drop them into the Q&A. Um, we've got one from Rachel Borovina. 
and she thanks you all for being part of this very valuable conversation. So she says, assuming key agencies embrace the cost benefit framework and a project has been implemented, how do pro programs temper the push for measurable outcomes within a typical funding cycle, such as the fiscal year budget or even a one to two year grant cycle? So she points out that one of our greatest challenges has been the time it takes for the shift in behavioral change um, and when those qu quantitative health outcomes can be reported. Leslie, do you have a response for Rachel on that? Sure, I, I think that's the, the holy grail of evaluation. Everyone wants to meet the demand and what folks are interested in is that immediate return on investment because it's so, um, you just want to grab it. You want to understand it. You want to see that there, there's something that's an immediate benefit. And as she mentions, this is really more of a long-term investment. And we've done quite a bit to look at process metrics. And it's something that we, we haven't done enough of, I feel, in, traditionally in the evaluation world. But looking more at the qualitative measures, the relationships that are being formed, the number of people that, that could be served, which is a quantitative metric. And we've actually put together a whole guide on how to evaluate built environment projects. And these are projects that could range everything from a new playground to a greenway network, a new splash pad, those kinds of investments in a community. But we put together a whole suite of evaluation tactics that range from low hanging, low cost, low budget, uh, low effort, all the way up to something very sophisticated where a community might partner with a university, for example, and do a very robust amount of data collection. And there's everything in between so that we can provide a variety of ways to do evaluation and show some of those interim metrics that are gonna lead us up to those bigger, big needle metrics that we all wanna see at a population level. And so we are promoting as much of those qualitative short-term and medium-term metrics as possible. And we're weaving that in with the stories that we hear, particularly from elected officials who talk about the economic benefit to some of these investments in their communities. And those stories coupled with the metrics seem to be a little bit of a sweet spot to be able to deliver a high quality professional report that has data, that has the stories, and people then start to understand it takes a while to get to those bigger metrics. But I've got something in the meantime that shows me the pathway. And that I think is the, the big uh, important point is to, to explain why it takes a while to get to those population level metrics but to actually lay out the journey of how you plan to get there and where a report in time shows where you are in that journey. And so I think if we just explain the process in a way that anyone can understand, show where we are in that process, use as many of those interim metrics as possible, weave those in with stories, that seems to deliver the information that folks want in a way that they can understand in a way that they can see where you are in the journey. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I see we have a question that uh, Randy just answered. Somebody was looking for the actual, um, the model itself. And uh, Randy, thanks for dropping that into the chat feature. That will also be included on the, uh, the, our Slack channel at Shift Nature Health as well. And so one of the things that um, is important to us in the work that we're doing here with SHIFT is uh, it's not only the research, which is one of our main focal points, and it's not only the business case, which is obviously what this is focused on, but it's the storytelling. It's like how you actually make it a, a human story that resonates with folks you're trying to influence. And Senator Gilmore, I'm just so curious about your perspective as somebody who is responsible for the legislation that affects the lives of your your constituents, the sort of importance of storytelling to you in, in your work? Well, I think that this tool is uh, everything to everybody. Uh, again, because um, our legislature is so diverse and it's comprised of majority of conservative legislators, I can see this tool 
bringing children outside, young people outside, connecting families. Uh, so those who believe in, in having a strong, uh, of course, all of us believe that, but those that it's more important to of having a strong family structure, this is a way to bring families, young people, moms and dad outside at a very low cost, a recreational activity. It's a way to gain and build social skills uh, so that uh, children learn how to interact with each other, learn negotiation skills, learn about nature, learn uh, even about agriculture. And uh, most important, I think to the Tennessee legislature, it's a tool that will show that this is just not a feel good activity, but it shows bottom line and it's integral to economic development. If we can keep our citizens healthier then they're more employable and that this helps increase um, the economic picture in the state of Tennessee. And thank you. We've got another question here from Teresa Pembroke. Hello, Teresa. It's her question is, since it sounds like you've been using self-reported surveys, extrapolated for participation data, have you considered other methods to get a better valid report of participation? If so can you talk about the pros and cons of various measurement tools for participation data? And Randy, I think this would go to you. Yeah, um, you know, that's a, a really valid point to make. Um, the reason we went with statewide self-reporting is because of the scale of what we were trying to um, assess. Uh, so there's a lot of shortcomings associated with those types of questions. They're asking a, a year in retrospect and people's recollection isn't necessarily, you know, that accurate. Um, but we have to deal with some of the, the messiness associated with the data. Uh, the tool calculator uh, that the trails calculator that's being developed uh, would suffer from similar things, but given it's more specific, when you when you downsize the scale, there's a lot of other tools uh, from direct observation of a number of people. You could have people do diaries, you could uh, do trip counters, and, and other information like that that we could really you know drill in on specifics, but then we're we're really narrowing the scope of what we're trying to do, and we can't we can't. Uh, it's just not feasible to try to do these other uh, observational and uh, diary and invasive techniques on a statewide level. So that's kind of the trade-off that we have is that we're estimating a, a population for participation and, you know, and that estimate's going to have some error uh, associated with it. Um, but again, if, um, you know, if we're all using similar tools, then we're all going to be suffering from the same levels of error uh, and at least then we will still be consistent. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, if, if we could ideally connect uh, people's phones and access all their information about how many steps and where they went and what they were doing, uh, you know, we could have much better estimates of what people are actually doing in their day-to-day -day, um, exercise and physical activity. Thank you. Um, Senator Gilmore, I'm so curious, you know, we, we want folks to get outside. We understand some of the health benefits, both um, physical and mental that accrue, but uh, a lot of times we can miss some of those barriers uh, that keep people from getting outside in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can say a word or two about that as it relates to your constituents. Well, again, I think this is a, a fun way if we can uh, impress upon our constituents that this is a fun activity. Uh, we can, I guess, be improving their health at the same time where uh, the children are having fun. And I guess I'm most concerned about its impact on overall health. Um, we have an extremely high rate of suicides uh, in the state of Tennessee. So bringing children outside, getting them to be active, I think will in increase overall mental health. And also Tennessee is the number one state in the country in terms of uh, bankruptcies, which is directly tied to medical costs. So if we can get people to get outside and move, it improves their overall health. I think that this will also uh, decrease the amount of medical expenses. So again, I think that this tool is just uh, everything to all people. 
whatever you come to the table being your passion, whether it's education, whether it's um, bottom line, the business model, or whether it's improving uh, general health, this too will be a benefit, a great benefit uh, to that individual legislator. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, can you walk us through a little bit of the timeline of bringing this online? What are your expectations in terms of getting this live? Well, the State Parks Department is going to be doing data collection this fall, so we'll be getting that user data. And then we are hoping to run the model. We're going to do it internally with some of the Tennessee Department of Health staff. So we're hoping that perhaps within the next eight or so months, we will have a, a model that we have results and, and we'd be happy to share those, but we're really excited about all of it. Wonderful, maybe we'll be able to bring you back on a year from now and look at some of the results. So that's greatly appreciated. <clears throat> and what, what are you hoping that folks will take away from, um, from your experiences to date in bringing this online? Well, I, I think there's a lot that can be said for looking at something creatively and not letting two things be a barrier. One, a lack of funding, or two, a lack of data. I think sometimes with data, we may let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And what I learned from running this model in the transportation arena is we did several different scenarios. And as Randy mentioned, this is a scenario planning tool and so it has assumptions and assumptions inherently are not exact, but that's okay. And we ran many different scenarios and they were all within the ballpark of a certain dollar amount. And so in the end, it really didn't matter if the dollar amount was exactly one specific dollar amount down to the decimal. What mattered is illustrating that there's a fiscal relationship between the investments that we're making and the savings that those investments can have in other arenas. And at the state level or the national level, those are really important because that can help us as we're looking at our budget allocations. And if we know that if we make an investment in one area, it may provide us some cost savings in another area, that's a really important fiscal consideration for us to have. So I, I think that's a, one area is to not let that data be a barrier. And the other area is to not let the cost be a barrier. We're going to run this model with the expertise of in-house staff. And some of the other things that we are doing, like the inventory and some of the, the questions that we added to our survey, we were able to either generate money for those creatively or some of the things we're doing at no cost. So don't let your imagination be a, a barrier when you're thinking about what some of the partnerships can achieve for, for your hopes and your dreams. And thank you. Um, we had a we had an interesting webinar episode of uh, a couple episodes back with Ralph Buckley, who quantified the um, the mental health benefits of parks worldwide at I think it was six trillion dollars U.S. And this year's shift coming up here October fourteenth to the sixteenth is entirely focused on the mental health benefits of time outside. Randy, um, does this tool have any ability to bring in some of those mental health benefits and some of the, the, the health care cost savings as it relates to those benefits? Well, um, so on one capacity, uh, depression, there is, there is the dose response function associated with the uh, benefits associated with um, risk reductions for depression. Uh, so that would be about the only mental health piece so in the model right now. Uh, to add broader mental health uh, savings would require really opening up the entire box and adding quite a bit more information. So on the one hand, the answer is yes, but it's very limited to what's already in there. And if we wanted to expand uh, the entire uh, ITEM model to include other illnesses, mental illness into that model would be quite a large task to do. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with any work that's moving in that direction that could be applicable here? Uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar with the latest literature in this area. I don't know, Leslie, you probably are better tied in with 
information. I know that there have been some really interesting studies in this area, and I think the field is headed in that direction. And mental health is so closely tied with our physical health and, and often gets a, a second uh, seat to more of the physical health benefits. But I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see some mental health tools of a similar ilk in the near future. Great, well, it looks like our project for 2021 with Shift. Um, well, I just wanted to thank you all for being part of this conversation. Uh, we're very excited about the tool. We're very excited about Tennessee's adaptation of the tool. Brenda, we're looking forward to you uh, promoting it throughout your, um, your state and with your constituents and helping Tennessee become a national leader in the adaption of it. So thank you very much for being part of this conversation. Um, we do encourage you to um, take part in a shift, which will be October 14th to the 16th. Uh, as well, we are looking forward to having one final um, shift webinar episode, and this will be on September 22nd. So this, um, this recording in particular will be accessible as all our recordings are on YouTube, and we also share the slide deck on this on, on Figshare for the, the folks in our research community. Uh, you can always go to Shift Nature Health for more information about this. Um, our next webinar episode is, uh, it's a very special one. It's another project that we've been working on. We've cataloged uh, more than 300 initiatives around the country that are providing outdoor rec and nature-based therapies for veterans. And then we've surveyed those programs to identify the current state of practices for those nature-based therapeutic interventions. And what we're gonna be doing with um, the September 22nd webinar episode is having a conversation with some of the principals that have been part of this project and begin to look at what a, some, a set of best practices in the space would would look like. And uh, what we found to date is there are no best practices. <laughs> it's kind of the wild west out there. And so we've been working a little bit with Colonel Sally Colhart, the founder of Nature and Health Foundation. Uh, she has manualized interventions, in particular for horticulture in, in Britain. And there are implications for best practices for outdoor rec and nature-based therapeutic interventions for veterans. Where this gets so interesting is the application in the civilian population. So this will be a special episode. It's going to be at either nine or 10 o'clock mountain time. And it will be a panel discussion followed by a World Cafe series of breakout rooms that help us to beta test this technology that we're using for shift, but then also get into some of the nuances of the conversation as it relates to manualizing these interventions for both veterans, but then also the implications for that broader population um, in society at large. So we do hope that you're able to join us for that. Thank you again for participating. And of course, this is all leading up to this year's shift, October 14th to the 16th. It will be virtual. We hope that you're able to join us. It is looking at equity access and the mental health benefits of time outside. And you can find more on our website. So thank you so much for joining us here today. and. Um, we hope that you are able to get outside and that the weather cools off a little bit where you are. So thank you very much and goodbye.